want to say a warm welcome to the evening service at the Edom Church in the Home Valley. We're glad that you've joined us on this occasion. We know that you're going to blessed, be blessed today. I know that you're going to be blessed as we just hear the word of God and are encouraged by his word to our lives. So we thank you, Jesus, for your goodness towards us tonight. And we open our hearts to receive your word to us that will inspire our faith and draw us close to you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And Father, for others that are close to us, Lord, we pray that whatever their need might be, whether it would be a a health need, whether it be an emotional need, Father, I pray that you'd be very close to them in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Gal. Thank you. Good evening. So I'm going to read 2 Peter 1, 19 to 21, short passage. Here it is. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well, that if you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in all time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So let's just unpack that slightly in just a couple of minutes. We have a more sure word of prophecy, or we could say a more permanent word. Peter here has just been relating the incident when he saw Jesus transfigured on the mountain and heard the audible voice of God. But then he says, we have a more sure word or a more permanent word of prophecy. In other words, what he's saying is the written word, the word of prophecy, the word of God to us, his word, is greater than just a vision or an experience or an audible voice. As great as those things are, we have something even greater because if you have an experience, it comes and it goes. But the word of God, the word of prophecy is always with us. We have it always with us. So it's a more sure word. It's a more permanent word of prophecy. And he continues, whereunto you do well if you take heed. In other words, give God's word your attention. As unto a light that shineth in a dark place. So keep your attention fixed on that word like a light in a dark place. If you're in a cave and you can't see a thing and someone puts the light on, you're going to focus on that light. You're going to be led by that light so you don't stumble. And that's how we need to focus on God's word. Until, how long do we focus on God's word? Until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. Until revelation comes, until faith comes, until manifestation of that promise you are believing for comes. Hallelujah. Knowing this first, so here's something else we need to know. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. So in other words, scripture is not written from man's viewpoint. It's not man's philosophy. It's not man's understanding. That's not where it comes from. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us all scripture is God-breathed and is inspired by God and profitable to us. Hallelujah. Very quickly, Psalm 132 verse 2b tells us that God has exalted above all things his name and his word, and he has magnified his word above his name. That's how important it is. And Psalm 119 verse 89 tells us that God's word is forever settled in heaven. It's established, confirmed, fixed, constant, lasting, firm, permanent, and unshakable. So when life throws you a challenge, go to God's word. Take heed of that promise. Stay focused until the day dawns and revelation and faith arise in your heart. Because that word is for you from God. And it is yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Let's be encouraged by God's truth. He speaks a better word over you than the doctor or the bank manager or your friends or your family. He speaks a better word. Amen. Let's worship him. Hallelujah. Tonight's first song. I'm trusting in your word, trusting in your cross, trusting in your blood and all your faithfulness for your power at work in me is changing me. Amen.
you so much. We thank you that you are so faithful to us and that you have given us your word, your truth, your promises on which we can depend. Forever, O oh Lord, your word is settled in heaven, permanent, secure, everlasting. It will not crumble as we step out upon it. Hallelujah, because you are a faithful God. Perhaps one or two of you would just like to lift your voices to him right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you tonight. Indeed, you are a faithful God. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, that no matter what comes into our lives, you are there. Hallelujah. You are there, Lord, and you bring healing into our lives. Lord, we, we just praise you and thank you because you're all sufficient. You are so faithful, Lord. But we sometimes we can't understand why, but that's our God. There's nobody like you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you're a faithful God. We think of this season as a season, season for weddings and couples promising each other to be faithful. Your faithfulness is so secure, it's so strong, it's Hallelujah. unbreakable. Thank you, Jesus. It's unfathomable. Mm. Um, it's way beyond any kind of earnestness that we could understand as a human being towards another or any desire or will that we could understand. Your faithfulness Hallelujah. is just, it's part of who you are. You cannot be unfaithful to us. Hallelujah. You're just so secure. Mm. We're so secure in you. Hallelujah. Mm. Thank you, God.
Thank you, Jesus. We join with the heavenly host in giving you all the glory. Amen. For those of you who don't know, this is Tess, all right? So um, you live home first way and you first came to the church a couple of years back. That's an interesting story in itself. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, about three years ago, um, I was looking around the charity shop in Home Firth, um, yeah, yeah. Honley even, yeah. and um, the people that I were with saying, oh, should we go and have a drink? So I went, oh, yeah. So we went into the cafe, and um, Ian mm. was working there at the time. You didn't know it was an Elam cafe? I didn't realise it was an Elam cafe at that time. And then um, my, the people that I were with, Maureen and Roy, were sort of said... Um, you know, about it being Elam because they had clocked it and was talking to Pastor and uh, I just was quite rebellious at that point because I'm like, I was quite angry with churches anyway and I just went, well, what do you know about Elam? Yes. And um, Of course, Maureen and Roy had been praying for you for yeah, a long time. they had been praying for me <laughs> for a very long time to come back to God. So... And so uh, I was serving the coffee, and I think the conversation went around what's all this Elim and, and everything. And I began to explain how we met at the village hall, because that's where we met before COVID and everything. And then you sort of dropped the bombshell and said uh, something about your Elim history, didn't you? Yes, yes. I had um, been to the Elim Bible College for three years. And. Um, so that was how many years ago now? Oh, I graduated, oh crumbs, it was in the 80s, right. 87 I think All I right. graduated. 30 odd years ago, Yeah. this was. Yeah. And if it's not a rude question, how, how, how long had you been away from the Lord uh, in the sense of rebellious and um, not wanting anything to do with him? About 10 years. 10 years, yeah. 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 So there you were on that midweek afternoon, having found yourself in the, in the cafe. And one of the reasons why I wanted um, Tess to share this story, because it is a, an example of how I took the opportunity <laughs> to sort of tell uh, the people around the table about the church and what we believed, uh, where we met, and all the stuff that we uh, do as a church that I wouldn't normally tell any customer that comes in. I don't say, shall I pray for you? And um, here's my card. Can I ring you up or anything like that? I don't do anything like that. But when an opportunity like this arises, then I sort of take the opportunity to tell them about the church because the inquiry is coming from them. And I felt that it was a divine appointment on that afternoon. Definitely. It definitely was. So it ended up with me giving you my calling card yeah. and I said here's my card you can give me a ring and then I did something very bold which I don't normally do to strangers I said to Tess what's your phone number um, uh, and on the Sunday evening when Tess said she says oh I'm going to come I'm going to come well if all the people that came to church on a Sunday came who said they were going to come you know there'll be hundreds here today but I felt just something that was different about this conversation that I had. So I took her phone number, and on that evening, I think I even sent you a text to say, to remind you that we met at six. You did, and actually, uh, on that conversation, you said to me, if you don't come on Sunday, I'll, give, I'll call you uh, and right, catch yeah. you up. Okay, yes. So... You came. I came, and from that, that first time of coming, I just felt accepted, and I felt... I just felt God's presence yes. um, within the church and in a way that I'd never experienced it before in any other church. In any other church. And I just felt at home. Yes. And that's all in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. Then we had an event last February. Tell us about that. Oh. Yeah. In January last year. Oh, is it 20, January? Yeah, yeah, 26th of January last year, I had a stroke um, and ended up in hospital. Um, wasn't able to walk or move and I was in a wheelchair and being hoisted in hospital and while I was in hospital I just felt God's peace come upon me in a way that I've never ever felt that before in Good. all my life and I just felt God's love surround me at yeah. that point yeah. and 
at some point, uh, uh, at one of those points, I just felt God sort of said to me, everything is going to be fine. Yes. You're going, you're going to be fine. And I took that and he gave me a scripture and I can't remember what the scripture was. Um, but it basically said that I would be well. Yes. And God would see me be well. And because God had already done the healing. Yes. Already. So, but I, I didn't quite realise that at that point. And I'm kind of thinking, but why am I not getting well? Um, and then I, I had the blessing of being able to go and when I was discharged from hospital, a family in the church here actually took me in and I stayed with them for six months. Um, And then the council and um, occupational therapy and physio got involved and they have adapted my home a little bit to meet my needs. And... um, Yeah, wow. Yeah. And... Show us what you can do now that you couldn't do before. Well, before I couldn't even move my fingers and I can move my individual fingers. And that was about as high as I could lift this arm. And now I can sort of lift it up. Yes. And praise, praise God, really. So that's really good. Yeah. And um, I had my occupational therapist and my physio um, had a meeting with me in January this year. And they were like, we're having to rethink about what, what to do and how to keep working because you've gone further than we ever imagined you would Amen. go and yes. we we but all all three of us just acknowledged that it was because of god and yes. thankfully both my physio and occupational therapists believe in god yes Amen. so it's been Praise really god. good blessing. Amen. Amen. bit of theology now then don't take your microphone off bit a of, bit of what thing have you learned in the last couple of years that sort of changed your thinking I've learned quite a lot in the last since I've been with this church I've learned so much and I guess part of me thought I knew quite a lot before I came to this church and I was probably a bit arrogant when I first came to this church and thinking nobody can teach me much but God has just taught me so much since I've been here you know I have learned that actually God wants the best for me amen and he has already done um, and um, done everything that I need. Yes. He's already um, paid for my healing. He's already paid for my sins. And, you know, God is just there and he just wants to bless me abundantly. Yes. And that's something that I will hold on to because if it hadn't have been for me accepting that divine appointment of mm. coming to the cafe yeah. and meeting um, Pastor and coming to the church... I don't know where I would be today having had the stroke because yeah. all my support came from this church um, and that I've had since I had the stroke. So it's been absolutely brilliant that, you know, God paved the way. You know, he knows what's in, in the future. and yeah. um, We don't and we may not understand it. But I can look back now and see how God just brought me here. By me accepting that that divine appointment, he brought me to this place. And, you know, I'm just praising God now because he is just so wonderful and he he loves me. Yes. And, yeah. Amen. And he's got so many good things for you in the future. Absolutely. And uh, let's just pray for Tess and agree with her that he who has begun a good work in her will complete it. Amen. And he's got good things for her in, in, in the Amen. days ahead. Father, I bless you for Tess. Father, thank you for that divine appointment that there was a few years ago in the cafe. Father, thank you for the questions that were asked. Lord, Lord I, I just uh, not wishing to, to, to put the attention on myself, but Lord, I'm just grateful that I took the opportunity that you gave when you gave it. And didn't ignore it because as a result you've done something marvellous in Tess's life and you're bringing her on leaps and bounds. And Father, I thank you for that healing that is working in her life and coming into full manifestation. She's not there yet completely, but Father, she's on her way. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, In Jesus' name we give you the glory. Amen. 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 Praise God. Thanks again. Okay, so this, (laughs) 
So this is where we were last week. See then that you work circums- walk circumspectly, not as fools but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. So circumspectly means to walk accurately, deliberately with care, not as fool, fools but as wise. We'll look at what it means to be foolish in a minute or two. Redeeming the time, making the most of every opportunity. And last week we we looked at this verse uh, with with reference to carefully accurately and deliberately making the most of every opportunity to witness and shine the life of Christ the love of Christ the light of Christ uh, to those that we meet and we talked about how we need to be sensible in our witness how we don't sort of go into somebody's stand in front of somebody uh, who, who we've never met before and shout praise the Lord in their face We don't say that we're going to pray for somebody when they've not asked for us to pray for them. We don't impose ourselves on people, even in a church setting. Even if we had visitors amongst us this evening, and uh, we have visitors this evening, but we, um, uh, we we don't push ourselves onto those. We don't tell them that we're going to pray for them if they don't want to be prayed for. And I gave you examples of how I have spoken to people at the cafe, and I, we've just heard from Tess here how that occasion when she and Roy and Maureen came into the cafe that, that afternoon and there was that opportunity, she was talking about Elim, I talked about Elim here in the church, I described my, I, I introduced myself as the pastor, I sensed that, that, that Tess had been away from the church for a long time and maybe that God was now using this as an opportunity to draw her back, so I took that opportunity to invite her to um, the Sunday evening service and I gave her my card and I took her phone number, I reminded her by text the evening before uh, to say that hey, we don't forget we meet at six. And I think on that occasion as well, Gail may have been trotting down the village and going to the co-op. And I said, oh, before you go, meet my wife. So there was an opportunity. I don't introduce all the customers to my wife. But I took the opportunity, as I believe that God had a divine appointment on that occasion. As we said last week, that we pray, when we are praying for our unsaved friends and relatives, we pray that God will bring Christians across their paths that would witness to them. And often we are the answers to those prayers. The prayers of other people. We are the Christians that are walking across the paths of unbelievers that they've prayed that God would send. And when that opportunity presents itself in front of us, we must accurately and deliberately and carefully make the most of that opportunity to share the love, the light and the truth of God's word to them. We don't shove the gospel down people's throats, but we do so gently and carefully. Now, whilst we're part on this verse, redeeming the time, let's look at it from another angle, because some uh, commentators were uh, saying that uh, Paul was saying, don't waste your time living like you used to. Make the most of the life that you now have left that you are living. Don't live like you used to as a pagan. Make the most of the opportunity of the time that you have left on this terrestrial ball, as John Wesley would describe it. The time you have on this earth to glorify God, to live for God. And if you remember, uh, uh, the whole of Ephesians 5 is don't live like the pagans used to, but live as a believer. Richard Baxter was a Puritan leader in the church Uh, He lived in the 17th century. He said, spend your time in nothing which you know must be repented of. Well, that's an interesting thought that we can talk about on Tuesday and Thursday nights. It's cafe groups, by the way, this week. Spend your time in nothing which you know must be repented of. So if you're walking down a road doing something, if you're walking down a track or you're doing something in your life which you know is wrong, (laughs) don't go down there. Don't do it. Don't do anything that you need to repent of in the future. And he also said, spend your time in nothing which you might not pray the blessing of God. Um, You can't pray the blessing of God over something uh, like deceit, for example. Uh, You know, I I, I could tell you a few stories uh, 
being very careful not to try to identify the situations. But say, for example, I can't understand why the, uh, the, the I'm, I'm in so much trouble with the police with speeding through uh, in, in my car and, and everything. And I told them I was on the way to the hospital because my son was in intensive care. And now, and I prayed to God that I wouldn't get a ticket, but I got a ticket. I said, well, what? You said that your son was in intensive care and that was why you were speeding. Yes, I thought that if I said that, I'd get off. Well, you can't pray God to bless something which is, which is untruthful, can you? You can't blame God when you get a, parking t- uh, a speeding ticket for lying and speeding. I came across this from Chuck Swindle. Uh, it, this is wasting your time now, so... Uh, he, he, he takes an, an angle of saying that Christians should make the most of their time, not waste their time. So he says there are four ways to waste your time. First, you can worry a lot. Start worrying early in the morning and intens- intensify your anxiety as the day passes. So God doesn't want us to worry all day. That's a waste of time. Make the most of every opportunity to glorify him and to praise his name. Uh, second, uh, this is the next... Uh, Second way to waste your time. Fix your attention on getting rich. We can discuss these at groups on, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Third, compare yourself to others. Deary me. You know, how much more time do we waste comparing ourselves to others and thinking how oh, we're not like them and I wish I were like them and because I'm not like them I must be a failure and all that kind of thought that, that, that sort of circles round and gets nowhere. What a waste of time. And lastly, with Chuck Swindle, he says, fourth, lengthen the list of your enemies. A waste of time to worry, to get attention on on getting rich, comparing yourself to others, and lengthening the list of your enemies. That's a waste of time. So let's move on to verse 17. Here it is. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of God is is what the will of the Lord is. If we've got some time left on this planet and we are living for God and we want to do what God wants, we would do good, we would do well, we would be wise in understanding what God wants to do through us and in us. Understand what the will of the Lord is. Do you know that God has a plan for your life? Well, we looked at it when we were in Ephesians 2.10. Let's look at it. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You know, and God has a plan for our lives. And it's good that, that, that God has a plan. I don't, hope you don't mind me using you as an example of Tess. God has a plan for Tess's life. Hallelujah. And your life, he's got exciting things ahead for us, things for us to do, things for us to to glorify his name, things that will do us good, things that will bless us, things that will honour him. So what is God's will for my life? What is God's will for your life? Well, let's start off by looking at the things that we know are God's will for our lives. 2 Timothy 2, 1 Timothy 2, 3 to 4 says this, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Saviour, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That word desires in our text is the same word that is translated will in our Ephesians text. It is God's will that everybody comes to know him and accept his forgiveness in their life and to know the fullness of the Holy Spirit in their lives. That's God's will. That is fundamental in our understanding of who God is. He wants us to accept Jesus as our Lord and Saviour. So it starts there. Then there are also other things that we can be sure about. What are God's will that are contained in God's word? Psalm 119, 105 says this. It says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a lamp to... uh, Uh, Sorry, a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So, because of his word, 
We know that he wants us to put him first in our lives. We know that he doesn't want us to murder anybody. We know that he doesn't want us to steal. We know that he doesn't want us to lie. We know that he doesn't want us to commit adultery. So from God's word, we can understand some other fundamental things that are his will. We know that it's, uh, it's not God's will that we should uh, run off with the uh, woman next door to Australia. No. So again, at a foundational level, we know what it is. It's God's will to put him first in our lives, to love, to tell the truth, to be kind, to be caring, to be compassionate, to be generous, to prefer one another. So be wise. Don't be fools. As Christians, we should know these things. Don't be foolish and act as if you don't. So there are things where knowing his will is fairly straightforward. But what about those areas in our lives where it's not so easy to understand, where the Bible is not so so specific? Should I buy this house? Should I buy this car? Should I go for this job? Should I marry this person? Should we have more children? Should we not have any more children? Where should we live? All these kinds of questions that come up in daily lives, in our daily living. What do we do in those circumstances where there is not a specific scripture? Now, I know that some people have said that, you know, uh, it's... Well, in the old days, uh, there was a scripture in the... There's a scripture in the Old Testament where, where, where Moses roared off in triumph. So, you know, you could argue that he wanted you to buy a Triumph motorbike. Uh, but that was a joke, by the way, but a um, bit of humour. <laughs> so, so there was those... But, but generally speaking, we don't get those details. You shall live in Honley. It doesn't say you live in Honley. You shall live at number 45 and on Meltham Road. And you shall have one child and you shall work for Sainsbury's. Then you shall work for the Ealing Pentecostal Church. That's not in the scripture. So how do we determine what is God's direction for our lives? Well, the first thing that we do is ask him for direction. Ask him for wisdom. James 1.5 says this. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Now, there's a couple of things that are interesting from this verse. He says that he's more than willing to give us wisdom. So God is liberal with wisdom. He's more than willing to give us wisdom. He's not reticent in in, in giving us the answer to the questions that we have. So often we we think that God is silent and he doesn't want to speak to us about these things, but he does. He is liberal in giving us wisdom, liberal in giving us understanding. And without reproach. It's not like you, you knock on his door and say, God, I've got a question for us. And he says, go away, Ian, not you again. You've asked me too many times. Leave me in peace. You knock on God's door and and he says, go away, I've told you before. Now, don't want to hear anything more of you. You know, sometimes like an impatient father when his child is pestering him for something. God is not like that. When we go, go to God, ask him for wisdom, ask God for direction. He gives wisdom liberally and without reproach, without telling us off. I've got a scripture now that's not on the slide, Gal, so this is a late addition. This is Psalm 139, verse 10. Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. Now, why have I included that scripture is because wherever we are, Whatever situation you find yourself in, the scripture says, even there, your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Even there. And you might think to yourself, well, I'm a million miles away from God. Even there, God will guide you. You might say to yourself, well, I'm facing this difficult situation, this impossible situation, this big challenge. Even there. God will guide you. 
There is no circumstances, no place where God will not guide you and give you direction because he is liberal in giving wisdom and without reproach. Psalm 130, 21 says this. Isaiah 30, 21 says this. Your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Sometimes it's just that we hear a a quiet voice behind us saying, hey, this is the way that you should go. And we know for certain within our hearts, within our spirit, we hear God's voice in our inner being towards us. Psalm 32, 28 says this, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I think, I don't know whether it's this particular version, I I should have looked at it, but there's one version that um, uh, says, uh, I shall guide you with mine eye. So, you know, God has given us the, sort of the, 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 sort of the, the shaking of the head, the looking of the eye. This is the way that you should go. But how do I know that God has spoken? How can I be sure that it's God's voice to me? Well, here are a few principles. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. That's Colossians 3.15. 3, the word rule there is the word that, Uh, is the word arbiter or the referee so the referee is the one who shows the red flag or the white flag when he uh, blows the whistle and points forward we know that that's the way that is is the way that you should go when there's a red flag it's it's stop foul don't go game has to stop for a moment or two So peace is to be the ruler, the referee in our hearts. So if we think that God is leading us in a certain direction and we go to bed with an unsettled heart, we don't have peace about it, then we can see that as a, as, a, as a guide that that is not God leading us because God always gives us peace when he shows us a direction and the way that we go into, uh, that is, we, we feel happy about it, we feel peaceful about it. We don't feel unsettled about it. Let peace, the peace of Christ, rule in your heart. But then, let's add a few more print scriptures that have some principles that go alongside this. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How do we prove what the perfect and acceptable will of God is? By surrendering our lives to him. By saying... Not my will, but your will. You know, so often we can go to God having made up our mind beforehand what we want him to do. And we expect him to rubber stamp it, rubber stamp our ideas. But actually, God wants to rubber stamp his ideas on our lives. He wants us to follow him. Alan Redpath, a a, a preacher, said, before we can pray, thy kingdom come, we must be willing to pray, my kingdom go. And then Adrian Rogers, an American preacher, said um, uh, that the Holy Spirit must not only be resident in our lives, but president in our lives. I quite like that one. He must be president. He must be the first uh, on and all. It's not my will, but your will. And so when we approach God, asking him the direction to go, (laughs) we've not already made that our minds up already. And by the way, we can perhaps uh, include in this that if you're making a big decision and you're unsure, it's always good to clarify your thinking with another mature Christian. Someone who's not just going to agree with you because they don't want to offend you, but because they will give an honest evaluation. Maybe they will be able to share scriptures or bring perspective that will either settle your heart or confirm the red flag. Now let me say something that I hope will encourage you. Because... 
as a pastor, <laughs> you probably thought of all the, you, you probably think, you're maybe thinking about all the mistakes that you've made in your lives. The times when you've not listened to God, the times when you've gone your own way, when the, the times when you've deliberately gone against God's will and you've known you've deliberately gone against his will, uh, those times when you've made innocent mistakes and you've earned up in, in a mess and in hindsight you weren't listening to God and all these kind of things. I want to bring a message of hope there because you might say, well, <laughs> I've messed up Ian, I've, I've, I've wasted uh, all this time, God's no longer interested in me because I've gone in the, wrong, uh, uh, in the wrong direction. I've been disobedient and there's been condemnation and you've thrown up your hands in despair in, in hopelessness. Let me give you a, an illustration that will perhaps help some of you. I don't know whether, well, most of you know what, a, you know, all know what a sat-nav is, don't you? Uh, most of you have got them built into your car now, and if you haven't got them built into your car, you normally get one that you stick onto the windscreen with a plunger. Um, uh, and you set the direction in, and when you go the wrong way, it says turn around and go in the wrong, turn around at the earliest opportunity. Gal always tells me off because I never listen to the sat-nav. Uh, always think that I know best. And sometimes we think that we know best. We go the route that the sat-nav doesn't want us to go. But what does the sat-nav do? The sat-nav recalculates the route and puts you back on track. And then uh, you might go adrift, you might take the wrong turn and you might make the mistake, you might deliberately go the wrong way or you might inadvertently go the wrong way but the sat-nav recalculates you to get you back on track, to get you going in the right direction again. Now, we all understand what the sat-nav does. Isn't this what God does in our lives? If we're confident in listening to the lady on the sat-nav, or the voice, the gentleman, whoever you've got as your voice on your sat-nav. If we're confident in obeying the sat-nav, shouldn't we be confident in obeying and trusting God, who when we make mistakes, is the one who is faithful, recalculates the route, but puts us back on the right direction. We might waste a few minutes. (laughs) That's inevitable if we go in the wrong direction. We might waste some time. Unfortunately, many of you can probably identify years in your life when you strayed from God and wasted time in your life. But thanks be to God, he is the one who is always wanting to guide us back in the right direction. He is the one who gives wisdom liberally. He won't stop giving wisdom. He gives wisdom without reproach, even there. And it's the times when you are most lost that God is still there giving direction. Even there. All is not lost. All right, here's another verse that we could add if you want to know God's will in your life. Delight yourself in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. When we put... Uh, when we delight ourselves in him, his desires become our desires. It's like when you're, when you're courting with, with your girlfriend. When I first met Gail, I didn't like cheese. And she says, I don't understand why you don't like cheese. There's nothing not to like about cheese. And do you know what? Because I loved her, suddenly I like cheese. <laughs> you understand? When we delight ourselves in the Lord, when we love the Lord more than anybody else, even those things that we didn't like to do in the past, we like to do now. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. So suddenly you like cheese and that is your will to eat cheese. We delight ourselves in him and his will becomes our will. Just as when we're courting, our girlfriend or our boyfriend's will becomes our will. 
because they are so special to us. Let's finally look at this then. It's five past seven. Finally, we won't look at that. I'll start that next week. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Have you been blessed? Anybody confused about what God is saying to them at the minute? Well, (laughs) don't be. Because God is a generous God. He's a loving God who loves to tell you, loves to communicate with you. He's not one who hides. He's not one who plays hard to get. Without reproach, even there, God wants to speak to your heart and encourage you. Father, I thank you that you have good things for us. Good plans for us. Plans to give us a hope and plans to give us a future. Father, thank you that they are plans to do us good, not to harm us. Father, I thank you that they are plans that glorify your name and extend the kingdom. Father, I thank you that they are plans that are perfect for us, that you purposed before the beginning of time. Father, I pray for those folks here this evening who are perhaps unsure about a big decision that they have made. Father, I pray that you would be liberal in giving them wisdom. Father, that you would show them, guide you, guide them with your eye, speak to their hearts and give them peace. And may you settle it in their hearts, the direction you want to take them. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I pray for those that are feeling, oh, I don't know, condemned might be the wrong word, but upset that they may have messed up in their lives. Father, I thank you that you, even when we mess up and waste time, you put us back on the right course. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And I, Father, thank you that time may be wasted, but Father, Lord Jesus, I know that you well enough to know that you make up for lost time. Bless you, Jesus. We give you the glory and give you thanks. Amen. Amen. Bless you, Lord.
Don't forget, if you want to call me, uh, you can call me on 01484 323 978. If you want to call my mobile, it's 0747 277 3243. Uh, info at hvelim.org.uk is my email address if you want the email notices and prayer requests that come that route. Uh, don't forget that it's cafe groups Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, I know it's the bank holiday weekend. Uh, have a great time, whatever you're up to, and be blessed by the best. Amen. Thank you for coming.